Right, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Des McNulty from Policy Scotland here at Glasgow University. Um, we're absolutely delighted uh, to have the opportunity tonight of having Sir Ivan Rogers lecture to us on this topical and seasonal topic, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Um, I'm not sure it has the happy ending that Dickens has, uh, so I think we might just have to uh, go with the, the realities that we, we, actually, we actually face. Um, Sir Ivan has actually lectured to us twice before. Um, they have been fantastic lectures, and I have absolutely no doubt that tonight's will be equally uh, interesting. Um, I don't think anybody's going to walk away happy, um, but then people maybe didn't come along for happiness. I think they came along to find out what is going on, and more particularly, what might be going on in the next year or five year, year period. And really, there is nobody better qualified to talk about that than Sir Ivan Rogers, uh, ex ambassador to uh, the European Union, the person who, in a sense, has been most involved uh, throughout the, the period between 2010 and 2015 in dealing with. The, the European Union, so going all the way through and towards the, the, the referendum um, that, that, that resulted with, with the Brexit vote. Since leaving the civil service, Sir Ivan has actually been, you know, in many ways, I would say that the government's most informed and not necessarily sympathetic critic. Um, <laughs> but he's been able to do that from a fantastic position of knowledge, not just of the process and, and, and what's happening in Europe, but the people and the personalities involved and, and what people in Europe are actually thinking about what's going on in the UK. But he's also been very much in demand from people in the UK to explain to them what is, what is happening. So, so I, Ivan has been speaking to a whole series of, of different groups of people about how Brexit is currently affecting them, how it's going to affect them in, in the future, as well as his civil service contacts that, that no doubt tell him what's going on in Whitehall at the present time. So with no more ado, can I hand over to Sir Ivan and invite him to introduce his talk, The Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come. Well, thanks very much, Des, for that very kind introduction, and thank you all uh, for turning up. Uh, it's a great honour to have been invited uh, back here to give a third uh, lecture, uh, despite your experience of the last two. Um, and as Des says, they're not necessarily the most uplifting in terms of happy endings, but I will try and give you an honest take on where we are. Given where we are, I had actually been hoping to talk about sort of technocrats and bureaucrats and technocracy and political accountability, but given where we are politically in much the biggest political crisis since the war and arguably a major constitutional crisis too, the only thing to talk about today is the crisis uh, likely to confront us at the Christmas yet to come, Christmas 2020. And when I come to think about it, um, I realise that made me rather the rather forbidding ghost of Christmas yet to come. Uh, not silent, I'm afraid, like that ghost, or shrouded in a deep black garment, but pointing at a future which can still be changed, but is highly likely to materialise if the message it brings is not heeded. I make no apologies as I'm here today in the role of the ghost pointing out what I think is the most likely future if nothing changes for focusing today mainly on a future in which the Tories under Boris Johnson win a majority at the forthcoming election. Now, as a former civil servant, I've long ago set aside the freedom to express personal political views, uh, but I'm as obviously as keenly interested in the possible outcomes of the election as the rest of you. We can all read the polls. We can follow the work of many of the experts, even from this fair city, even though some of them are down the road in another very fine Scottish university. And as we sit here today, the version of the future I will concentrate on, therefore, is a very likely one if things continue on their current course. But let, let me start at the beginning with the ghost of Christmas past, because the ghost of Christmas past reminds Scrooge of some important moments in his past that have had a determining influence on the present. This ghost, you may recall, is a kindly one and says to Scrooge, these are the shadows of things that have been that they are what they are, do not blame me. 
Before the crisis which nearly brought down Mrs May uh, at Christmas 2018 was the one that nearly brought Mrs May down at the crisis of Christmas 2017. There ought actually to have been a crisis at Christmas 2016 too, but at that stage you may recall Mrs May was being lauded to the skies in her party and by the media for having actually made the errors that eventually brought her downfall, guaranteed her downfall, and gloomy spectres, one of which stands before you, were warning of difficult, who were warning of difficulties ahead, were very much out of favour. The 2017 crisis was whether we could even get to the end of the first phase of the Article 50 process. The fateful December 2017 text, which delivered the famous Irish backstop solution, also gave Mrs May the promise that she wanted of a transitional period lasting until the 31st of December 2020 contingent on the UK ratifying the withdrawal agreement, with which she could then reassure the increasingly alarmed private sector that they would have time seriously to prepare for exit. When I last spoke here 18 months ago, we were a few weeks before the ill-fated Chequers proposal, and I was attempting, obviously in vain, to warn of the illusions running on all sides of British politics and to urge that we have a more serious national debate about our choices post-Brexit. It was obvious by then that Mrs May was in deep, probably terminal trouble. And Chequers, of course, marked the departure of the then Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, as well as the then Brexit Secretary David Davis, and therefore the start of what was effectively a year-long campaign from the right of the Conservative Party to ditch their leader and to go for a harder Brexit. That campaign succeeded, of course. It's always useful to remember that it's those protesting most loudly currently about members of the Westminster Parliament thwarting of the will of the people who've so far gained most from the situation. The main reason Mrs May's deal failed three times to pass was, after all, that her own party's right voted against it each of the three times in sufficient numbers to kill it. But they had not at that point been able to remove her. Result, the paralysis they themselves sought until they could remove her. Many on the Tory right wanted no deal. They still want it. No trade deal, which is slightly different, but still of a highly problematic beast at the end of 2020, the Christmas that's yet to come. And the people who yearn for no deal are currently actually pretty confident that the likely incompatibility between what they think they've so far persuaded Prime Minister Johnson to advocate and what the EU would ever agree will secure a no deal outcome. That may well prove correct as I will try and explain later. Maybe it won't, and Prime Minister Johnson will pivot to an entirely different position from the one he's espousing in the election. But let's be clear, uh, to turn back could also turn out to be, as we've seen so often since the referendum, much easier said than done. Now, the current view being propagated by these people, and indeed by the Prime Minister, is that following the election and the passing of the withdrawal agreement by a majority Tory government, there'll be a tidal wave of investment ready to flip, roll into the UK once the agreement is passed. That is, in my view, rather far-fetched. Investors understandably need to see the future relationship settlement, not just the withdrawal agreement, and to understand what it might mean for their investments short, medium and long term. There's no certainty whatever that those negotiations will end in a deal and many reasons to believe that they might not, and I shall outline those later on. The failure to assassinate Mrs May politically via last December's party vote of no confidence in her made no real difference in the end. The proponents of a hard Brexit wounded her badly enough for their purpose and carried on paralysing her proposed deal in the Commons until they brought her down. Of course, they were massively assisted in doing so by people who made the exact opposite calculation, that paralysis would lead to the reversal of Brexit. And I think one's entitled to have severe doubts about the wisdom of their judgment too. Both sides just doubled down. There has, throughout this sorry saga, been a depressing absence of people searching for any Brexit resolution which might over time command really substantial majority public support across the UK. Now, maybe it was always a chimera to believe that there could be a, resol a Brexit resolution with a serious majority public support. I personally don't really think that. It would necessarily, though, have required a leadership we haven't had from any side. What's most striking now, though, 18 months on from Chequers, is that no one is seriously seeking such a solution that the public across the UK collectively could support. 
and that all the illusions I was talking about 18 months ago remain on every side. Indeed, if anything, the debate has regressed back to an even more heated version of the debate we had at the time of the referendum. And frankly, almost as if none of the events of the last 41 months had happened. And here we are, approaching Christmas 2019 without much sign that we've learned anything from the ghost of Christmas past. So the ghost of Christmas present, you'll, you will recall, is a jolly and initially rather reassuring figure who seems initially to be promising feasting and merriment as well as peace and goodwill to everyone. However, the story soon turns a bit darker as we see beyond the bonhomie and start to consider what's going on for those who are not at the Christmas party. I must confess I was rather tempted when looking for a literary or film title for today's lecture to go for Groundhog Day. Another well-known story on the theme of whether we can learn from the past and the present in order to move forward into the future. I'll come back to the Christmas Carol later, but one thing that put me off Groundhog Day, I must confess, was that I discovered that the Prime Minister himself was deploying and deploring what he called groundhoggery. I think my version of Groundhog Day, which is Groundhog Day 2, Endless Brexit, uh, is perhaps a little different from his, but it's definitely a better film. Because for me, what's most Groundhog Day about the current debate are three things. First of all, you wake up nearly every morning, not to Sonny and Cher, but to some government minister, frequently the Prime Minister, declaring on the Today programme that a great comprehensive trade deal with the EU can be concluded very rapidly next year and is the easiest in human history because we're aligned on day one. We heard exactly the same stuff from exactly the same people three and a half years ago when they told us that trade deals both with the EU and with all other major players around the world would be ready for the day after, Brex after Brexit, which as you will recall was at that point slated for about eight months ago today. So it wasn't true then and it's not true now for reasons I'll try and set out. Second point about Groundhog Day, the political system here seems to be thinking purely tactically and short term, with a focus solely on the domestic political handling, rather than thinking about how, in the impending and toughest stage of the negotiation, we avoid the exact repetition of the syndrome we experienced to our great disadvantage in the first stage. In practice, this Prime Minister, for all the talk about getting Brexit done, is now basically replicating the strategy errors of 2016, 2017, which brought his predecessor down. This is diplomatic amateurism, dressed up dis domestically as boldness and decisiveness. It may indeed work splendidly at home. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it does, where understandable public boredom and frustration with endless Brexit agonizing plays well for it. But meanwhile, the EU is doing as it did in 2016-17, methodically getting on with designing the sequencing of the new process which will maximise its own leverage in the next phase, or indeed the next many phases, as I personally think there are many more to come. Brexiternity, indeed. Third Groundhog Day element, hearing that the trade-offs inherent in Brexit dismissed essentially as non-issues. We continue to be offered the prospectus that we can enjoy autonomy on trade and regulatory policy on both goods and services, not simply on migration policy, outside the single market, outside the customs union, but via a so-called best-in-class free trade agreement, not suffer any real downside in terms of market access into easily the biggest market for our goods and services. One slight problem with that, it's clearly untrue, and it doesn't get truer through endless repetition. Now, to be clear, the illusions are not all on one side. Uh, three and a half years on from the referendum, the EU 27 have inevitably moved on, to use that ghastly phrase, and concluded that the next European Commission and Parliament mandates and the next seven-year budgetary period will be without the UK and they need to get on with their lives. Remainers who think that the clock can simply be put back, I think are in denial about where mainstream continental European opinion is. Jeremy Corbyn's statement that he will get Brexit sorted including having held a referendum confirming its sorting, within six months of taking office, frankly deserves the Brussels eye-rolling that it duly gets, as does the idea that he'll not take a public position on which way the public should vote on the defining issue of the day, even after he's negotiated the deal he professes to want. To govern is to choose, as they say. So most of the elites, frankly, think a Johnson outright victory is the quickest route to getting the intended withdrawal agreement through. And they think they can afford to wait and see, once the withdrawal agreement has passed, whether, as they would view it, the UK starts to become more serious and pragmatic again about the future relationship which could be built over some years, 
or whether we're just heading for several years in which we don't really do much together and we see some pretty brutal contractions in two-way trade and investment flows. The puzzle for the European elite, I think, is why did the UK turn its back on the single market, having been its most enthusiastic advocate across all parties for three decades, and why the UK elite still seems determined to tell the public that a free trade agreement could replicate all we liked about the common market when that's patently untrue. And it's only a matter of time before that becomes obvious to voters. Fine, I, I do understand that view, but I think the European elite too is a bit trapped in a version of the world they used to live in, but we've long since lost. And it's time for the EU to think a bit more clearly and strategically about the future relations with the UK, because they could get a lot worse than they are today from here. So Groundhog Day 2, the Brexit years, did feel rather a good working title. But in addition to it having been deployed by the Prime Minister, there are two problems with Groundhog Day. Firstly, uh, that one way and another in the world of the EU, the alarm will wake us up one day with the situation having changed, whether we're ready or not. Secondly, that in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray discovers compassion, empathy and unselfishness through the endless repetition of the same experiences. And I'm afraid that while we appear to be trying this as a method, I don't see any signs that going round and round in the same circle is helping us to learn anything. In A Christmas Carol, in contrast, the ghost of Christmas present forces Scrooge to look at experiences which he doesn't know about and hasn't considered, teaching him to see not only the suffering of the poor, but the potential for social unrest if society can't meet the needs of those who Scrooge thinks can be dealt with by the prison and the workhouse. So if we are to learn, we need to break out of the rut we find ourselves in after three and a half years and pay closer attention to the world outside our own bubble. So now we come to the Christmas yet to come. I want to explain why I believe the biggest crisis of Brexit to date lies ahead of us in late 2020, to explain why that crisis is, in my view, virtually inevitable and how I think it'll unfold, and then to try and offer some thoughts as to what we should do from here. As I said at the beginning, in the Christmas yet to come that is the version of the future I'm here to point to, we will imagine that a new Tory government is elected and speedily passes the withdrawal agreement which the Prime Minister put unsuccessfully to the House in the autumn. That's not the only future which is possible to, to, to state the obvious, but it's so likely that it's important we think about it in depth and in all events to come through, though the, through the exit process in the best shape, it will, be, it will help us to be clear-minded about what Brexit truly entails. Now, if the withdrawal agreement were to pass, we enter into what, laughably in my view, Prime Minister May persistently termed the implementation period, the IP as it's called, a term still in use by Prime Minister Johnson's ministers, despite the fact there is nothing to implement. The reality is that it was and is a standstill transition period, during which the UK carries on being subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, paying full contributions to the EU budget, and being obliged to enact on our own statute book laws made when no Brit was in the room, either in the Council of Ministers or in the European Parliament, when those laws were passed. Now, rather understandably, in my view, this period of full cost but voiceless and voteless transition generates a considerable amount of grief on the Conservative benches, at least, where it's widely viewed as an intolerable period of so-called vassalage, which must be curtailed. But a serious transition period was always going to be needed, during which the treaty covering the future relationship, trade, economic and security, would be negotiated, because contrary to what senior ministers, including both the current Prime Minister and the former Prime Minister, as well as all of those people most loudly now complaining of vassalage, Contrary to what they repeatedly said until well over a year after the referendum, there was no chance whatever of starting negotiating this treaty until after we'd left. Article 50 was purely about set settling the withdrawal issues. The legal text necessary for detailing and governing the future relationship were always going to be a matter for the period after our legal exit and for a different negotiation under different articles of the treaty. This stuff is really not rocket science unless you're intent on not understanding it, or perhaps intent on the public not understanding what you're doing. Which is why people like me were actually tearing our hair out in 2016 about this transition, knowing that it might last for years and not months, wondering how, if at all, that could made be made democratically sustainable. Because, and this is the crucial point, 
The legal text to which I refer will have to be more complex, detailed and lengthy, and fuller of caveats the further out of the European Union we choose to go. And therefore, the further out we want to go, the longer it will take to negotiate the necessary agreements. This is the first critical point which gov government ministers repeatedly continue to get wrong or choose to mislead the British public about when talking in these weeks about getting Brexit done. The fact of being aligned on day one after exit does not make the negotiation of a trade deal easier. The current alignment of UK and EU rules, which Prime Minister now Johnson refers to as the state of grace, is wholly irrelevant. The only relevant question is where you want to be on day two, day 200, day 2000. The publicly avowed Johnson intention, after all, is to be much more distant from the EU and to adopt a model on both goods and services which is substantially more divergent from EU rules and standards. He does not want a so-called high alignment model. That is, after all, the whole basis of the appeal, his redraft of the political declaration accompanying the withdrawal agreement, had to the Conservative right, which Mrs May's political declaration did not. Hers kept us, in the view of the right, too closely regulatorily aligned with the EU and they view that as wholly unacceptable. His liberates us to diverge much more radically. Now, it's always been true that if Brexit turns out to, be, to mean diverging much more substantially than, say, Norway, and leaving both the single market and the customs union, the exit process will be, take longer and be more difficult than ministers are still professing to believe is achievable. Why? Because if you actively want to remain rather closely aligned with the EU, you identify rights such as the free movement of goods, which will be granted in return for aligning dynamically, that means on an ongoing basis after exit, with a specified list, rather lengthy list, of EU legislation after exit, providing you also agree a mutually acceptable adjudication and enforcement mechanism. That's essentially how the European Economic Area Agreement the Norwegian model, as it's frequently called, works. And it's uh, as well how the Irish front stop arrangement, which Johnson negotiated instead of the backstop arrangement, uh, will also work, I think. Now, and let's be honest about that as well. What's proposed now for Northern Ireland, the Prime Minister decided that the new arrangement was completely fine, indeed what he called a great deal for Northern Ireland, but that it was wholly unacceptable for Great Britain. That's really told the EU quite a lot. Will the UK have left the EU whole and entire, as the Prime Minister put it? Well, up to a point, Lord Copper. The reality is that the economic regime for Northern Ireland will be different from that of Great Britain, and both sides well know it, even if much of our media is not inclined to say so. The proposed arrangement is actually a sort of high alignment model. And that, that kind of deal could be done quite rapidly and in a relatively short legal text, which as a consequence can be hammered out fairly fast. The substantive provisions of the European Economic Area Agreement, the Norwegian model, only amount to about 30 pages. But that's precisely because they deliver closer, greater trade integration, the comprehensive dismantling of trade barriers within the wider European bloc beyond the EU, and that includes the EEA countries, than this government wants. Under such an agreement, you would maintain a lot of your former rights, but that's because you'd submit to a lot of your former obligations. And those obligations are very significant. But if you want greater divergence from your erstwhile model inside the trade block that you're exiting, it's precisely because you don't intend to honour those obligations. Fair enough, but by definition, you must then start the negotiation bottom up and not top down. And the question then becomes, for every single sector of the UK economy, how far, if at all, beyond the baseline of commitments we make into the WTO, are both negotiating parties, we and the EU, willing to commit? And by definition, this will be more difficult, not less. Because the question then are how much scope for future divergence the, does the UK want to have in each area, and how much latitude is the EU prepared to negotiate? And the EU then, amongst itself at 27, has to calibrate the consequential loss of access to its market, which the desired UK degree of divergence might cost. And believe you me, even coming to a unanimous agreement inside the 27 on the right answers there will not be short or straightforward. And then all of this has to be written down in the treaty, which by definition will be binding on both parties. Take the EU-Canada agreement.
much cited, but in my view, not very well understood by the Johnson government. The substantive provisions of that agreement, much more distant than the Norway agreement, run to 550 pages. And the total text, including three protocols, 60 annexes, and a couple of hundred pages covering specific national exemptions sought by individual countries, run to nearer 2,000 pages. Just the process for calculating what are called rules of origin takes up 150 pages of the Canada deal, with specific rules covering products from barbecue sauce to soap. Such is the hugely glamorous content of free trade deals. But this stuff matters, and it matters to the profitability and hence the future location of businesses and some of the most competitive advanced businesses in these islands. And incidentally, that's just as true for small and medium-sized, fast-growing businesses and new tech as for incumbent bear moths, which I know ministers tend to view as the advocates of the status quo. There's just no escape from this balls achingly technical and lengthy negotiations on things like rules of origin and plenty else if you deliberately leave your erstwhile trade bloc. There'll be no new comprehensive deal with the EU without such provisions in it. The reality of free trade agreements and the really hard, boring grind of removing cross-border barriers to trade, especially the non-tariff ones, which are actually economically much the most important, but politically the least talked about in our country, is simply not the same as free trade sloganizing, I'm afraid. Dreams of market-leading Silicon Valley-type innovativeness away from the sclerotic old Europe in exciting new advanced industries, they'll just remain dreams if you don't address these issues because these rules are completely critical for manufacturers of advanced goods and the components which go into them in any sector? Or are we now fantasizing that on the technologies and industries of the future this stuff doesn't matter? I rather fear again that we are. So please don't kid yourselves, as many at the top of our government seem to, that somehow because we were once an EU member, none of this will have to be negotiated from the bottom up with us and that we can have a sort of Norway-style document negotiated top-down instead, but with much greater divergence than Norway has in every area where we want it. That's completely to misunderstand the process and the legal consequences of leaving. Divergence is a lot more complex to manage than convergence, and vastly more unusual. Indeed, I would argue unprecedented for any major developed country since the Second World War to want to do it. Once you leave, unless and until you have a new, thinner, but still preferential in the jargon trading agreement, you simply have nothing beyond what you've committed to with all other partners multilaterally in the World Trade Organization. Only those who don't understand just how little that actually gives you in key sectors of the economy are blithe about the prospect of WTO only. So my point is the choices you make about the future you want will have a determining effect on how easy and how long it will take to get there. Our leaders need to be honest about this unless they're intent on continuing to tell people wrongly that we can escape supranational ju adjudication as European Court of Justice and enforcement and end free movement of people and still enjoy all the current benefits of access to the single market. Now, if those are your priorities, and they seem to be what's driving our position on Brexit, and that's what we're aiming for, they're legitimate priorities, but they do have automatic consequences. We also hear from the same people that their post-Brexit model is a plethora of bilateral free trade deals struck by a global Britain with its own autonomous trade policy. As I've commented before, it seems to me extraordinarily perverse to be making the case as to why preferential deals are absolutely essential for the UK with every major market except its largest one, which is the EU, which operates and negotiates as the single market, the clues in the name. Now, Again, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying here as indicating that I believe that we should have aimed or should still be aiming at an EEA-type model or Norwegian-type model, because I don't. I've never, as a, an ex-Treasury official, thought that that kind of model could work for a large, diversified, services-rich economy like the UK, as opposed to a commodity-rich, relatively small, open economy like Norway's. Long term, we can't end up, I think, as a rule-taker on issues on which the stability of our financial system depends, and we have a huge financial system. And that was always at the crux of many battles we fought, I fought personally, when inside the EU. There was, however, a really huge, valid question about the nature and length of the transition and the warmth of the waiting room 
we would be in during it, which needed proper consideration in 2016 before we invoked Article 50 and, frankly, didn't get it. The reason why we didn't get it was because the Prime Minister, Prime Minister May, believed that an EEA model, even on a transitional basis, prevented her ending free movement of people, which she viewed as her primary goal post the referendum. What motivated her was never the kind of question which preoccupied people like me, namely, how on earth are we going to make a living in the world? That goal of ending free movement of people is shared by her successor. I'm not commenting here on his personal views or about the fact that the views he expressed on immigration policy when Mayor of London appear to be rather different from the ones he espouses now. I'm commenting on what we're to understand is his policy as Prime Minister. And if the goal of the UK is a points-based system, he keeps on referring to it, Australian points-based system, which makes no distinction between EU and non-EU migration and focuses on attracting highly qualified people from wherever in the world, again, fine. But the inevitable EU response is the termination of the obviously linked free movement of services, plus ending the current arrangements for the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which are critical to the cross-border mobility of professionals, both UK and EU ones. Candidly, I've just never understood those ministers, which includes many senior members of the Cabinet, who seem to think we can and should abolish any type of European preference in our migration system, but that it would be utterly outrageous of the EU to reciprocate and treat UK citizens and mobile professionals precisely in line with the way they treat professionals from other third countries. I find that firms I talk to now, Des alluded to, are only just waking up to the huge implications of this on professional mobility. And much of the UK services sector still harbours hopes that having basically been forgotten, in their view, by two successive Prime Ministers to date, their interests will, to some degree at least, be catered for in a new free trade agreement. I fear they're going to be sorely disappointed because the EU simply has no intention here of offering more to an ex-member than it does to other major third countries. De facto, the last two UK Prime Ministers are arguing for a no deal on services. And that's on all services, that's not just financial services, on which, as I've said, the financial stability case is demonstrably stronger. We actually export far greater volumes of non-financial services than financial services, and the EU is massively our biggest market for those exports. Ministers just don't ever want to tell businesses that that's actually what they're doing, and they don't want to tell the public why it's a great idea to do it. It's, but it's, it's back to this point about the parallelism between the rights we're we want to exercise and the obligations we're ever prepared to take. So then, if we truly only wanted even something along the lines of, though presumably better than a Canada-style deal, Canada trades something like, I think, 3% of trade volumes that the UK has with the EU. Beca but we want that, and we can't live with anything more than Canadian levels of obligation. It'll be laborious to get there. It will end with a painfully long, complicated legal text, which has to be negotiated issue by issue, sector by sector, exemption by exemption, but still be ratified as a single text in every national parliament and some regional parliaments of the EU. In other words, it'll be harder to do Johnson's Brexit deal than to do May's, and it was already harder to do May's Brexit deal than to replicate a Norwegian-style deal. It's the exact opposite of what ministers are telling you. Or even a Swiss-type deal, which has a lot of rule-taking in it, actually, as well as quite a bit of divergence, but is so legally complicated with a huge number of legal agreements between Switzerland and the EU that it's been negotiated and renegotiated over decades, not years. These are all choices. There's no such thing as the one and only true Brexit, let alone the will of the people that's only been, been divulged to a chosen few, chosen by themselves mostly. We don't thankfully live in a Leninist or Robespierreist state, at least not yet. For the moment, though, we seem to be off to Canada, uh, but without our services sector. Now, all of this inevitable complexity, if, if that's not enough, the transitional period, originally, as I told you, conceived of as 21 months long, from March 2019 to December 2020, was thought too short by virtually all experts, has actually shrunk in half. So if we assume Prime Minister Johnson, with an overall majority, gets the withdrawal agreement through by the end of January 2020, just 11 months of the originally planned 21 months remain. 
So let's be heroically optimistic on this, and let's say within six weeks of the passage of the Withdrawal Agreement Implementation Bill, the EU side at 27 could reach unanimous agreement, and un unanimity is required, on what it wants from the negotiations. Let's be even more heroically optimistic and say that the UK Cabinet can sign off on the same timescale on an agreed account of what it wants from the negotiations, which is more serious than just a pious shopping list of demands for a single market level of rights without any of the obligations, which the other side, for the reasons I've just explained, legal and substantive, will immediately dismiss as, as for, for the birds. So we would then have about nine and a half months from mid-March 2020 to negotiate, conclude and ratify the entire deal. And to be clear, ratification, to permit entry into force of any such agreement, unlike the Article 50 process we've all been living through the last few years, will entail all national parliaments and some regional parliaments passing the deal. Why? Because it's inconceivable that the EU27 will agree a deal with the UK under sole European Commission authority, or competence to use the EU jargon. And we can't very well complain about that either, because that was always a cardinal objective for the British government when we were in the EU, to ensure that national administrations and legislatures retain rights in the conclusion and ratification of all trade deals. We thought it was central to sovereignty, as did many other players in the 27. And one cannot, more's the pity, I'm afraid, easily reap a quick, balanced, early harvest of good things which don't need ratification by everyone else. Now, the political implications of this are pretty obvious, in my view, on issues like fisheries and food standards, which are every bit as politically contentious elsewhere as in the UK. I said in my nine lessons a lecture and book last year, other people have sovereignty too, other people have politics. And again, a deal here with us, post our exit from the common fisheries policy and the common agricultural policy, is self-evidently much harder for the EU than one with Canada, because it's of much greater consequence for the EU. Uh, as it is for the UK. I'm not saying, and I've never said, that no trade deal of any sort would be possible next year. I am saying, as I said well over three years ago, before I quit and after I quit, that a serious wide coverage free trade agreement cannot and will not get done in that time. And I know no one on the other side of the channel who thinks otherwise. Now, the major threat for the UK, as I see it, is therefore not that nothing at all gets done next year, but that because we're under immense time pressure, and we're known to be desperate to escape vassalage by the end of 2020, something to which the Prime Minister daily keeps committing and has now put in the Conservative Party manifesto, the EU side just sees a huge open goal, opportunity, and repeats its playbook from the Article 50 process. After all, it thinks it worked really rather well, both against Prime Minister Bay and Prime Minister Johnson, and it's rather hard to argue tactically that it didn't. So it entirely dictates the contents and pace of what gets done. It runs the clock down towards the next cliff edge. It confronts a desperate UK Prime Minister with a binary choice between a highly asymmetrical deal on the EU's terms and no deal towards the end of next year. And if all the time pressure is on him, you can safely assume he'll make a lot of concessions in the end game, and yet he'll still have to emerge blinking into the light, claiming he's won. So if, if the EU can then button down in legally binding form what it feels it most needs out of a deal on that timescale, then it may well feel job done. Uh, its members are scarcely going to want to have to negotiate and then ratify a whole series of further deals with the UK thereafter if they feel their, their key objectives have already been secured. As the UK discovered much too late, I was trying to warn of this before quitting, in late spring 2017, in the Article 50 process, it had unwisely triggered, without understanding or negotiating how it would play out. Once the 27 set their own negotiating mandate, their own negotiating directives in print, those very largely dictate the scope and the ambition of the negotiation which unfolds. The same is very, very likely to happen next year. These are very big elephant traps for the UK Prime Minister in 2020, and he's currently digging them deeper. The EU is acutely conscious that in order to have more than the nine months or so I described in which to negotiate, the UK Prime Minister would have to decide he needed an extension of that transition period, and he has to decide that under terms written down in the withdrawal agreement by no later than the 1st of July 2020. That date is in the Withdrawal Treaty. It's not a date that can be shifted except by a treaty change, which again then requires ratification in all 27 sta states. 
So there's no serious prospect of getting that treaty change. And so as often in this process, in my view, the markets, the media, the wider private sector are much too complacent that some means of kicking the can down the road, which everybody thinks is the classic European style, and substantially extending the negotiating process would be found if there were a majority Johnson government with five years ahead of it. But that looks very problematic to me. I also slightly struggle to see Prime Minister Johnson wishing to extend. But on the question of whether to extend, He's surely pretty unlikely, just three months after the potential start of negotiations, already to have reached the conclusion by June that the following six months will not suffice. Maybe he will, but it seems improbable to me. He also knows that the moment he extends, he'll be straight into another budgetary negotiation about the UK's contribution over the one or two years of any extension, which might involve eating a lot of words, some of which were on the side of a bus. He further knows that the right, which will have been strengthened inside his party if he won the election, will decry an extension as an intolerable prolongation of vassalage. And that's what he's playing now, both to the right of his own party and to Farage outside his party. Now, I should be very clear here, my point is not, absolutely not, to welcome this thinking on either side of the channel, very far from it. I just fear it points to a repetition next year of exactly the syndrome we've been through in the last three years and a repetition of the myopia, I think, on both sides, which lands us with a poor and deteriorating relationship on multiple things that really matter economically and strategically, both to the UK and the EU. I'm just stating the likelihood, I personally, frankly, think near certainty right now, that the incentives on both players now play out this way. Put crudely, the EU will feel that in the time available, rather little serious can get done, and it'll think that's no bad thing, as it can fully exploit UK desperation to get something over the line. Why not take advantage of another Prime Minister who's boxed himself in? They're talking up a deal now, not because they've become undying fans of Brexiteers, but because they can see there's an opportunity here for something that works pretty nicely in the EU's interest. The UK will think that the overwhelming political objective is to deliver full exit by the end of 2020. Let's forget the little local difficulty that you told the public that you were getting Brexit done the year before. You know, they'll no doubt find a way through that. So a quick and dirty deal with precious little substance beyond zero tariffs and quotas has some appeal to the British, despite the economic reality that the vast majority of the barriers to trade, which we actually need to keep dismantled, are non-tariff barriers. And despite the obvious fact that a tariffs and quotas only deal is obviously more in, say, French and German interests than in British interests. So we could, as in spring 2017, be on tram lines to this rather rapidly. Put another way, the jelly will be setting on a potential end game in 2020 as soon as the negotiating mandate starts to appear in print. That's probably about just over three months away. Reality comes at UK Prime Ministers pretty fast these days. Now, more specifically, how do I believe then the EU might aim to organise next year? And why do I believe there will be a major crisis before the end of 2020? Well, as I say, the EU's methodology will, exactly as in 2017, be essentially to say to the UK Prime Minister, it's your own red lines that have entirely governed the ambition or the lack of it in our negotiating mandate. So they'll say, we accept, as we always said from Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker from early autumn 2016, if you want divergence and you want disalignment, a relatively thin free trade agreement is the most that can be negotiated. If, you're to, if you were to change your mind and you, or as you go along about any of your red lines, we stand open to reconsidering the level of ambition, but time's very short, etc., etc. We've seen that film before. On that basis, they'll say, you'll note there's nothing in our negotiating mandate on services, financial or other, because you made clear you don't want it. And you want the regulatory autonomy to diverge from us. That's your choice. We'll therefore autonomously, at 27, make a judgment as to whether we can apply our existing equivalence regimes, in the jargon of financial services, for third countries to you. But that's a matter for us alone, and it's not a matter for negotiation with you, and you're not getting special treatment. The same applies on data protection, data privacy. We shall decide autonomously, at 27, whether your existing data protection legislation warrants an adequacy determination, again in the jargon of the general data protection legislation, on the same basis as we've accorded that to other third countries. Not up for negotiation with you, not in the mandate. On free movement, we note that you still intend to end it, and the corollary of that, given the 
indivisibility of the four freedoms that underpin the single market and your clear views on the role of a supranational court is that the benefits of the other three freedoms on goods, services and capital don't apply to you and that market access for your firms on both goods and services is seriously impacted. Your choice, not ours. On some other issues, from aviation to road haulage, well, those aren't really for this agreement. We don't have time, uh, not for now. We'll get round to an open skies agreement, as they're called in the jargon of aviation with you. But as one block of 27, not individually with you, and it won't contain the nine aviation freedoms of the single European skies deal, which you have in the single market. So it'll pose major problems of ownership structure for people like British Airways, because it won't go beyond the first four freedoms in aviation. Now, on goods, they'll say, well, we know you want zero tariffs and zero quotas across the board, and we're open to that. Of course, they'll be open to that it's profoundly in their interest. But just a few points you Brits need to understand here. Firstly, it's obviously your sovereign right not to align in industrial sectors if you don't want to, although the previous Prime Minister told us she did want to, and others like the Swiss who want better access to our market than you're going to get do. To be clear, incidentally here, this is something that the media frequently misses, the words as close as possible relationship in goods, which were inserted by Mrs May in the political declaration, were deliberately removed at the request of Mr Johnson. As I say, he wants divergence, not alignment. People are not recognising this clearly enough. So they'll say, but it's our sovereign right to set the rules under which your firms can expect to export into our market. That's how trade works. We're not changing those rules just because you left. So let's take chemicals as one example. They won't put this in the mandate, obviously, but I'm just giving you an example. What does this mean? On chemicals, there's this thing, third country rules, third countries are sort of non-member states, are set out under the so-called REACH regulation, registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals regulation. You can see how exciting my life used to be. Um, so your exporters, they'll have to find an importer in the 27 who's prepared to take responsibility that their products meet EU requirements because EU rules are now unenforceable directly in the UK. So you'll, their, your firms will have to make two filings, one with our regulator, one with yours, even if the rules remain precisely the same, which is up to you. And those filings are seriously complex, guys, but that was your choice. You can't live with supranational jurisdiction, remember? So you have to be out from under our regulator. That disadvantages UK firms, and of course it may encourage them to relocate plant into the European Union and away from the UK, but that's your choice. And if over time your regulatory decisions and ours diverge, tough. I'm afraid if you want market access, you're going to have to meet our rules. A parenthesis for you in this audience, regulated chemicals are in just about everything in daily life. This chemical stuff is massively important, but nobody discusses it in the media. Second point they'll make is, and some of this is highly controversial, but they'll do it anyway, you're a big, geographically close market, you want zero tariffs and zero quotas to continue, and that's better than we give any other non-member, well, we aren't going to agree that with that formal trade treaty agreement about not undercutting and not dumping. And that's real treaty-based conditionality we want in the form of dynamically aligning with our rules if you want fuller ma market access than other uh, non-member trading partners. And that includes things like food standards. You can forget much access to our market for your agricultural products if you shift to US standards or subsidies to industry, you know, state aids, all the stuff you hear from Jeremy Corbyn's side pr primarily. On energy, there won't be a deal with us at all without a corresponding one on climate policy, committing to a carbon pricing level in line with ours on an ongoing basis. On environmental regulations, social regulations. They're going to say all that. Um, it's interesting, Prime Minister Johnson's all we're already referring to domestic legislation he might pass on, workers' rights, environmental, other things. So he's making moves, but they're not going to accept domestic legislation as anything like enough for the conclusion of a trade deal. And thirdly, they'll say fish. We won't do zero for zero at all unless we sort out a fisheries deal as part of a trade deal, which protects our boats' access to your waters and replicates what we currently get on fish stocks and fish quotas. And because your fish processing industry actually relies very heavily on exporting into our market, if we don't give you duty-free access anymore on fish, we can probably close a large chunk of your industry down. So you can forget any chance of a zero for zero free trade deal flying 
in the parliaments of our fishing member states, which is eight of them, unless we sort this out. Fisheries is going to be an absolute nightmare in 2020 because, again, it's a zero-sum game. And it's hugely politically contentious in the eight fishing member states as it is here, and it's very difficult to see a deal which looks very different from the common fisheries policy fly. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying all of these are, you know, we have to roll over and accept all of them. These are negotiating positions. And you stick them in print early if you're the European Union in a mandate to demonstrate to the other side you're serious and have precious little room for manoeuvre. It's called trade negotiations. And if the UK, under this Prime Minister, takes a rather less supine approach to negotiations than under the previous one and has a more united cabinet, I presume he'll at least try and set out his own positions and priorities and some attempted reasoning behind both, more publicly than we've had in the last three years, when the tempo and the transparency have been completely dictated, really, by the European side. But... I look at the likely dynamics of next year from the outside now, if we face this approach from the EU, and I believe we will face this from the EU within about three months, and I'm really not sure I, I see how or why any deal gets done. We would end up with what exactly? A very thin Canada minus minus deal with zero tariffs and quotas, but only with extensive level playing field permanent conditionality, which the right of the Conservative Party will hate. And only provided we do a deal on fish, which is very hard to see why the eight fishing member states will be prepared to see any losses as a result of Brexit in what is a pretty zero-sum game sector. If they're shut out of our waters, the obvious retaliation is to shut our processing industry out of their market. Or if they did, why would the deal pass their legislatures? Their moment of maximum leverage on fish is next year, and they know it. And in macro terms, what would we be doing? The blessed German car makers we hear so much of from ministers and the beloved French knicker makers achieve their zero tariff access to the UK market and in goods the EU, as we keep on hearing from ministers, has a huge trade surplus in goods with us. Whereas the UK's access to their market in services, in which we have a huge trade surplus with them and in which the EU market is as big as our next eight put together, including the US and China, our market access goes a long way backwards. OK, so there'll be some sugar on the pill somewhere to make the medicine go down, but that would be the core of the deal that might be on offer from the European Union uh, next year. Well, chapeau, as they say, to the Eurocrats if they pull that one off. And they persuade the UK Prime Minister to sell it as a negotiating success. Maybe the party which obsesses about bilateral trade deals as if they're primarily about tariffs and quotas when they really aren't, can even be sold such a deal at the end of 2020. But I confess, I, I doubt it. I, I suspect all those, including some in the Cabinet, who've been exceptionally unkeen to see economic impact assessments of any of the options on the table, dismissing all forecasters' models of bunk, might suddenly become super keen to see what the economic modelling shows about the economic uh, impact on the UK of that sort of deal as opposed to a no-deal exit. Now, I think I know all the objections I would hear about this rather gloomy prognosis of what 2020 holds. This Prime, Minister, that this Prime Minister's revealed preferences for a deal and not no deal, that he's demonstrated agility and determination and guile to get one and will have the authority in the party after an election victory to force it through, that we all said it couldn't be done this autumn, but it has been, that he's not Theresa May and so forth. I agree he's not Theresa May. Um, but as I say, on the future relationship, all he's actually done is go for a thin free trade agreement model, which was explicitly on offer from the other side for Great Britain from the very start in 2016. It's not a massive negotiating success to amend a political declaration to point in a direction which suits your negotiating opposite numbers just fine. And all he's sacrificed to get there via his Irish sea border pivot, the clear consequences of, of which, in my view, he's now denying, is the explicit support of the Democratic Unionist Party, whose support he will anyway not need if he wins the election. And on that, that's on the issue which was the obstacle to going for a more mid-Atlantic, more divergent, less alignment exit, which he wanted anyway. Well, maybe he would then, simply next year, try and snap up something which is demonstrably already on offer and call it a success. Well, maybe, but the price of level playing field conditionality and a fisheries deal will be very steep, and both will be very hard, I think, to swallow for the wing of the party that put him into the premiership.
They might, of course, swallow level playing field conditionality, although they really hate it if he tells them it doesn't really mean anything and once we're free, we're unstoppable. But what do you expect the EU side to do to that? They'll make very sure they seal that bolt hole in any legal text. And it is a treaty text. It's their biggest single preoccupation, after all. All the stuff you hear about Singapore on Thames and where the UK might go. Now, and taking on his party's right, to which his leadership will have added in the next parliament if they win an overall majority, is not really the same as abandoning the Democratic Unionist Party. Now, on the EU side, I know readers of this, and there will be some, will say, so what concretely are you asking us to do? Are you asking us to soft pedal our, the defense of our own fundamental interests? And if so, why on earth should we? We're not some charitable foundation for the rescue of distressed Tor Tory gentlefolk who box themselves into positions which they subsequently regret when they understand what they mean. Our priorities are the defense of what we've chosen to carry on building together and you've chosen to leave. And my answer to that would be no, I agree with you that the defense of the integrity of your project is paramount. And I agree with you that internal solidarity with one of your members must trump any relationship with a third country, even a big ex-member and a strategic partner of yours. And I also personally fully accept that exit has unequivocal and in my view very substantial legal and economic consequences which can't be evaded but are still being evaded by our political class. And I agree, I don't think you could have saved Mrs May from herself, especially given her successor's determination to remove her from office. But this relationship really matters to you, is what I would say to European friends and colleagues. If we're all honest and sober about where we are, this relationship has deteriorated, is deteriorating, and could continue to deteriorate, rather a lot. Now, there's no law of nature which dictates that the relationship with the exiting UK must end up thin and sour and conflictual, and it would actually be a very bad thing for all Western democracies if it does so. We have far larger similarities, fundamental similarities in our view of the world than we have differences, and we have plenty that in a sane world, if we could ever think beyond next week or next year, we would find new ways to work on together. But you do risk, you Europeans, in a hardball repetition of the tactics of the last couple of years, if you do that next year, ending up with a deal which simply doesn't fly in this country politically. And which, even if it did, far from warming UK public opinion, would probably alienate it further. And yet you consistently say that you want to create the conditions in which the UK rethinks its long-term position and wants to end up closer to you. So in the end, you too, you, the EU27, you must have a collective preference or be able to forge one for how the relationship should evolve over the next decade or two. Saying that you have none or that the closeness or depth or warmth is entirely a consequence of British political choices is, to put it no more strongly, a bit simplistic or, to coin a phrase, something of an opt-out. The UK trade negotiation is much the most economically consequential on your plates for the next mandate, despite the breadth of EU ambitions to do even more than the huge volume of trade deals you've accomplished over the last five years, on which I would say bravo. The UK is easily your biggest security partner in this hemisphere, and you have another one in the other hemisphere that you may not regard as wholly reliable at the moment. You've also got real and major questions about the best future architecture for all your projects, in which Brexit could have represented, maybe it still could represent, something of an opportunity to think again about what I would call differentiated integration in ways which try and escape the sterility of the debates we've had over the last couple of decades. The EU is, after all, now more diverse and differentiated than it's ever been before, and the EU's neighbourhood is more fractured, more threatening, and more in flames. So might it not be a better thing to think bigger and bolder about models of differentiation across the entire continent and reflect a bit more deeply about where you want to end up with the UK and others on a 20-year perspective, not a 20-month perspective? Or do you really think that a whole series of salami slicing negotiations in which a large chunk of the UK public could progressively become more convinced that we're just being screwed is guaranteed to get the right political reaction? Because if so, I'm not sure we're watching the same film. Now, what concretely does that mean uh, you should do? And as I say, one would get that expressed very vehemently from European audiences of a kind of, what the hell do you expect us to do about it? 
Well, in my view, not immediately just plunge into a purely internal negotiation at 27 to bolt down the parameters of 2020 in a lengthy negotiating text and only surface to talk to London thereafter once you've effectively cast the die for how the year is bound to end. And the year will either end in the year will end in a crisis, but it'll either end with a scramble to extend, to fudge, or with us jumping off the cliff. You have to, I think, on the European side, test out whether any sort of reset in the relationship is deliverable after our formal act of exit, if it happens under a majority Conservative government, before plunging straight into textual negotiations, which will simply cement positions. And that requires, I think, leadership, leaders' discussions, and not conclusions-driven textual processes. And you have to test when the UK Chancellor, Sajid Javid, said, as he did yesterday, our trade deals are a lot more ambitious than these sorts of generic free trade deals that were in the previous forecast by the Treasury. You have to test that out. Does that indicate real UK ambition for a comprehensive free trade agreement, coupled with any real understanding of what that entails? Or whether duty-free, quota-free, no alignment, freedom to diverge across all goods as well as services, but domestic UK legislation on workers' rights, consumer protection and environmental legislation is the summit of the UK's ambition, because the two are not remotely the same, and they're both being said by UK ministers at the same time, even during this election campaign. So if it's the latter, much thinner, then I believe we may be heading inexorably towards no trade deal, short, medium term a crisis at the end of 2020, and a very difficult relationship after that. I strongly believe, personally, that that's in neither side's best interest, but it might require now real bravery and vision from both sides to avoid it. Towards the end of the Christmas Carol, Scrooge says to the ghost, are these, are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persisted in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Well, the ghost here today has not been a silent one, as you uh, well know. But I, as I look ahead to the very likely crisis this time next year, and actually to the decade or decade or two ahead, I hope I've at least managed to explain, to point both to some courses which are better not persisted in on either side, but also explain why all the big choices on Brexit, which matter hugely for the UK, but for many others too, still lie ahead of us. Thank you. Well, I think we've had a, a fantastically intense exploration of, uh, of where we are. I think um, the Irish proverb, you know, when asking for directions, I wouldn't start from here, is, is probably appropriate in these, these circumstances. I hope you've all found it incredibly enlightening and, and feel that at least you're a bit wiser going out of the room than you, you were when you came in. Um, I don't think anybody promised you a happy process. Um, but if you do want to have the time to uh, reflect on, on what Ivan has said uh, and want it in front of you, it is actually on the Policy Scotland website and in, in, in detail. So if you want to, to look it up, you can, you can follow up uh, tomorrow, perhaps, or whenever, whenever you, you, you feel like it. Ivan's two previous lectures are also on, on our website, as is the lecture we had er, earlier in, in the autumn from, from Philip Rycroft. So I think we've got a pretty comprehensive set of uh, uh, you know, magisterial pieces on, uh, on, 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 on Brexit. Um, it only remains, I think, to thank Ivan so much uh, on my behalf, on your behalf, I think, for, 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 for delivering us this, this lecture. I think we've been very privileged to, to hear it. Uh, and I hope that not all his predictions come true, but I, I fear that too many of them will. Thank you very much, Ivan.